This week on the CNET Tech Review, Nokia unveils its first Windows Phone handsets, our favorite high-tech cars for drivers on a budget, the Asus ZenBook might make you forget it's not a Mac, and is your smartphone spying on you? Brian Cooley has the answer. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start things off with the good. Nokia announced its first two Windows Phone handsets on Wednesday, the Lumia 800 and the Lumia 710. The Lumia 800, though, is the phone that Microsoft and Nokia are calling the first real Windows Phone. It's due to hit stores in Europe sometime in November, but Nicole Lee has one for you to see right now. I'm Nicole Lee, Senior Associate Editor for CNET.com, and this is a first look at the Nokia Lumia 800, one of Nokia's first Windows Phone devices. It supports the latest Windows Phone 7.5 Mango operating system. It's made out of a unibody polycarbonate material. On the front here is a curved 3.7 inch WVGA AMOLED clear black display. And that means it has a polarizing filter that makes it look good under bright sunlight. The display is made out of Gorilla Glass, so it's scratch resistant. And it's also slightly curved to make it easier to swipe between screens. On the front here underneath the display, you get the Windows phone controls like the back button, the Windows button, as well as the search function. On the side here, you do get the volume rocker, the power button, as well as a camera button. On the top here is a headset jack, as well as a little micro USB port. On the back here is the 8 megapixel camera lens with the LED flash. The 8 megapixel camera can record in 720p HD video. It also has a Carl Zeiss lens. The Nokia Lumia 800 is powered by a 1.4 gigahertz single core processor, along with 512 megabytes of processor memory. It has 16 gigabytes internal storage. Because of its unibody design, it does not have a removable battery, but you can go to a Nokia store or a carrier store to have that replaced. It has the usual features like Wi-Fi, GPS, and more. It is a quad-band GSM phone, so it can be used internationally. The Nokia Lumia 800 also comes with support with a variety of Nokia services, like Nokia Drive, which is Nokia's turn-by-turn -turn navigation system, Nokia Music, which is Nokia's music store, and Nokia Mix Radio, which is Nokia's streaming radio service. The Nokia Lumia 800 will be available in cyan, magenta, and black. It will be available for around $585 without a contract. I'm Nicole Lee, and this has been the first look at the Nokia Lumia 800. It's still unclear whether the Lumia 800 will ever make its way to the U.S., but Nokia plans to offer a whole slew of Windows Phone phones to America in early 2012. And be sure to check out the step-down model, the Lumia 710, over at CNETTV.com. Up next, we've got a couple of products that offer big-ticket features at bargain prices. First, Scott Stein shows us an Ultrabook laptop that's even cheaper than a MacBook Air, followed by Matt Moskoviak with a surround sound speaker system for less than 100 bucks. I'm Scott Stein, senior editor at CNET.com, and if you're a Windows user who has been envying the MacBook Air, there is no better time for you than the present because thanks to Intel's term Ultrabook, there are a ton of laptops that are now coming out that are thin, that are light, and that look a lot like the MacBook Air. One of the most notable and one of the most MacBook Air-like is the Asus ZenBook. Well, here it is in this nice little padded envelope. This actually comes with the ZenBook, unlike MacBook Airs. It has a little pouch that's kind of attractive, and you open it up, and sure enough, here is the aluminum ZenBook. And it certainly looks like a MacBook Air in terms of its unibody aluminum design. There's a little bit more of a radial design here, that eye-catching, light-shimmering effect on the back lid and a little bit of a darker metal, brushed metal on the back, but um, it's a lot of the same feel, a tiny bit thicker and a little bit heavier, but really comfortable and very sturdy to hold. In fact, the Asus ZenBook, the UX31, which is the 13-inch version, uh, comes in at a lower price than the MacBook Air, about $200 less for the same internal components. 
the UX31E DH52, that's a not very zen-like name, but that's the name of this particular version, is 1099 and comes with a 128 gigabyte SSD drive and 4 gigs of RAM. And that matches what you're going to see on the 1299 MacBook Air. So it's a pretty good value. Add into that that this comes with a USB 3.0 port and HDMI. Although, take note, this is a micro HDMI port. You're going to need a converter cable to be able to plug that into your TV. But it does have VGA dongles and an Ethernet dongle that connects with USB that comes in the box. The ZenBook is named probably to create a sense of Zen composure and simplicity in a laptop. This does have pretty fast boot times and a very fast wake up from sleep, um, about two seconds, which is very competitive with the MacBook Air. But we didn't really find that keyboard or that trackpad to be very zen-like. In fact, we found ourselves missing a lot of key types when using this slightly mushy keyboard. And the trackpad uses Centelix instead of Synaptics, which means, in our experience, we found the trackpad to be a little more finicky and a little harder to pull off multi-touch commands with but it is a very large trackpad and equals the MacBook Air in its size and in its um, clickability. But if you're an AV hound, you'll appreciate the fact that this 13-inch screen has a 1600 by 900 resolution. That's a lot more resolution for your pixel dollar than the 1366 by 768 that you're going to see on most 13-inch laptops. And the Bang & Olufsen design speaker system and audio in this ZenBook laptop does live up to the hype. It sounds a lot better than similar ultra-slim laptops. Now, it's not going to blow you away like some super high-end desktop replacement, but it's great for listening to music and to movies. If you want to pay more for your ZenBook, you can pay as much as $14.49, which is going to give you a Core i7 processor and 256 gigabytes of storage. That's still less than you would pay for the equivalent MacBook Air at its high end. Now, if you love great sound and nicer screen resolution, and you can give up a keyboard and a trackpad that maybe are a little bit disappointing, and a battery life that is still OK, but doesn't perform as well as we found the MacBook Air to perform, give this a try. This is as close as you're going to get to a MacBook Air without it being a MacBook Air. I'm Scott Stein, and this is a look at the Asus ZenBook UX31e. Hey, I'm Matthew Muscoviak at CNET.com, and this is the Monoprice 8247. Now, most people know about Monoprice from the company's excellent line of cheap HDMI cables. And now the company is branching out to some other home theater products. The Monoprice 8247 is a 5.1 speaker system, and the pricing is just incredible, with this whole system costing just $84. That's less than $15 per speaker if you include the subwoofer. Now, the system includes four small satellite speakers, a center channel, and the subwoofer. The cabinets are plastic with a sandy texture, but they have some weight to them so they don't feel completely cheap. At this price, we were also shocked to see Monoprice included four swivel wall mounts in the package, which is something you don't even find on more expensive speaker systems. Now, around back, you'll see the metal speaker connectors, which are pretty decent, although they won't accept banana plugs, and you'll need to use 16-gauge or thinner speaker wire. The 60-watt subwoofer has a down-firing 8-inch woofer with a baseboard on the front, and the design has a pretty plain, boxy look. Now, for $84, we were expecting pretty lackluster sound quality, but Monoprice really surprised us. It doesn't sound great, but for a system of this size, it sounds pretty good. The subwoofer blends nicely with the satellite speakers, and it can play pretty loud without getting distorted. Of course, like any system this size, it does fare better with movies rather than music, so if you expect to listen to a lot of two-channel music, you'll probably want to consider something else. We also put it head-to-head -head with the $400 Energy Take Classic 5.1 system, and there's no doubt that the Energy sounded better in just about every way possible. But the Energy system is more than four times as expensive, and we're sure many listeners would be perfectly happy with the Monoprice's sound. So should you buy the Monoprice 8247? That depends on how much you're willing to spend. For $400, you can get much better sound quality from either the Energy Take Classic system or the larger Pioneer SP PK21BS. But if you can't spend that much, the Monoprice 8247 is the best deal we've seen for under $400, and it really is a perfect starter 5.1 system. I'm Matthew Muscoviak, and this is the Monoprice 8247. I gotta say, I am loving a world in which quality electronics are also inexpensive. What a concept! 
Also, that Zen book is H O T hot. Continuing on with the budget theme, it's time to talk cars. Having a lot of cool tech in a car is great, but not if you can't afford to pay for it. So here's Brian Cooley with CNET's top five high tech cars with low, low prices. In this economy, when I suggest a high tech car, you probably blanch at the thought of buying something which costs as much as a foreclosed house. But you can actually roll CNET style for a monthly nut low enough to swing even after you're laid off. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five high tech cars that cost under 20 grand. Reviewed and ranked by CNET so far in 2011. Let's hit the road. Number five is the Hyundai Accent SE. Now we love us some Hyundai and Kia these days, so why the bottom of the list? Well, because you can't even option a navigation head unit on any Accent at any price. And it doesn't have a very elaborate voice command system like a Ford Sync. So this is all kind of a throwback to a few years ago when car companies positioned their small cars as utilitarian transport that offered less. Now the Accent's a nice car, but they kind of missed the boat on this idea of really loading it up closer to the mid-range cars, at least optionally. Number four is the lovable Fiat 500C, the most stylish car on our list, though unnervingly close to Fred Flintstone's car in some aspects. Navigation consists of a clip-on TomTom unit, and the car's powertrain is, shall we say, modest, but it does offer a cousin of Ford Sync called Blue and Me, and a very cool power ragtop that opens up to La Dolce Vita, all for under 20 grand. Number three is the Chevy Cruze Eco. It scored high in CNET's review because of its wonder of an engine, a 1.4 liter turbo four cylinder that cranks out 2842 MPG while being sufficiently powerful and refined on the road, as is the whole car. You can't get factory nav on a Cruze either, but it does have OnStar, which can bring in a form of nav, and it also supports the new OnStar mobile app, which lets you control various aspects of the car remotely from your smartphone, while it's sitting still, of course. Number two is the newcomer in the bunch, the little Scion IQ. Very small, but not stupidly small, like a smart car. Instead, Scion has a smart strategy of offering an array of high-tech head units at good prices. And the IQ has Pandora integrated right out of the box. Its little motor is a 1.3 liter engine. It's best in cities, confidence killing on the highway, and sounds like it's grinding coffee in both situations. But overall, it's an affordable car with interesting tech options and a style that stands out. Just don't trip on it. Before I take you to our number one cheap tech car, check out this survey. According to Arbitron and Edison Research, the tech that we use most in our cars is still AM, FM radio, CD player, and cell phone. But when you ask folks what they love to use in their car, it's satellite radio, iPod, and GPS. And the mainstreaming of all those technologies and more into inexpensive cars like I'm talking about today is a very happy trend. Okay, the number one tech car to look at when you're on a budget is pretty easy. It's the Ford Fiesta. Two things stand out for us. First, Ford's excellent sync system, which I almost think is better on a simple display like in this car than on the elaborate LCD. It does a great job of recognizing contact names and music titles when you bark them out by voice. And Fiesta offers a dual clutch manual gearbox. Nobody else does that at this price, not even close. On the other hand, the navigation is kind of an OnStar-like system, which we found was sort of hit and miss. And even then, it only works when you have a cell connection. But still, if it's R20 grand, we're probably going to buy a Fiesta. By the way, everyone always asks at moments like this, what do I drive? Sorry to disappoint you, but my 88 Country Squire doesn't even have airbags. And I want you to be safe. For more top fives like this, go to top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. Of course, if money is no object, you might want to check out the 2012 Porsche Panamera Turbo S. I'm saving up for that. You can find our review over in the car tech section on CNET TV right now. But not right now. We've still got a lot more tech review coming up right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, 
Given the amount of personal data we store on our smartphones these days, if your phone isn't passcode protected, what are you thinking? While iPhones only offer the numeric keypad pin options, Android users have a few other choices. Here's Sharon Vaknin with the pros and cons for each one. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com and today I'll show you how to pick the best screen lock for your Android phone. When Ice Cream Sandwich is released, Android phones will get a super futuristic face unlock option, but until then, I'll show you how to choose the most secure lock setting already available on your phone. Let's start by heading to Settings, Location and Security, and head down to Screen Lock Settings to get started. Tap Change Screen Lock, enter your current unlock code, and check out the three possible lock options. Pattern is the default and most popular screen lock setting, but it's also the least secure because it can be easily cracked with the smudges you leave behind each time you unlock your phone. I don't recommend using a pattern lock, but if you insist on using it, maybe to impress your iPhone using friends, enter the pattern you want to use, enter it again to confirm, then uncheck Use Visible Pattern. This way, anyone looking over your shoulder as you unlock the phone will have a hard time seeing the pattern. Now, the next option is a pin lock. Pins are easy to remember and offer decent to great security depending on your number combination. The majority of people choose terrible pins like 1234 or 1111, but please don't be one of these people. Instead, choose a pin that's at least six characters and doesn't follow a numerical pattern. Once you choose your pin, then confirm it, uncheck visible passwords so that when you unlock your phone, your pin is hidden as you type. The last and most secure lock setting is password, which can be a combination of letters and numbers, offering the highest level of security. It is the most annoying form of security because it does take extra time to enter, but if you pick a strong password, you can rest assured the data in your phone is safe. Just tap password here, Enter it and confirm it, and uncheck visible password so that your secret code is hidden as you unlock your phone. If you have any questions or tech tips that you'd like to share, hit me up on Twitter or my Facebook page. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. I am so glad that Sharon is finally calling Android onto the carpet for the underreported problem of greasy finger security flaws. Because, ew. Speaking of you, let's have a look at some of the gadgets unfortunate enough to end up in the bad. Oh, printers. So necessary and so aggravating. Even the best of them make you want to smash them occasionally. So what about when they're not actually all that great? Let Justin Yu tell you all about it. What's up guys, I'm Justin Yu, printer editor for CNET, and this is your first look at the Lexmark Pro 715 multifunction printer. We're seeing the prices drop for all-in-one printers these days. Those are devices that combine a printer, scanner, copier, and fax machine in one. Unfortunately though, this one will set you back 200 bucks. So is that worth it? Well, not really. It's more or less the same as the previous version, that's the Pro 705, which you can now get for 100 bucks on third-party retailer websites. The LCD display up front here sits more flush into the control panel than its older brother, but for some reason the company got rid of the shortcut buttons altogether and they put them up as virtual controls on the screen. A little bit more inconvenient. It's also missing the media card reader, so don't expect to print photos directly off a memory card. You'll have to do it the old-fashioned way and plug your camera in with a hardwired USB cable. Another thing we don't like is that you can only fit 100 sheets of paper in there at a time, just for perspective, we prefer the Epson Workforce 845 printer for the same price that gives you a huge touchscreen control panel, two separate paper drawers with a 500 sheet capacity, and two separate media card slots with an additional USB port for printing off flash drives. That's a lot more functionality for the same price, so we're giving a thumbs down to this Lexmark Pro 715 and recommending you buy the older Pro 705 for cheaper or buy the Epson Workforce 845 if you're really looking for a printer that can do it all. You can read all the details in our full review on CNET, but that's going to do it for me. I'm Justin Yu. You just took a first look at the Lexmark Pro 715 printer. Thanks for watching. Thumbs down indeed. Plus, seriously, why haven't printers gotten any smaller? All right, let's leave that poor printer alone and move along to this week's bottom line. 
This week in the bottom line, we want to highlight a new show here at CNET TV called Device and Conquer with Brian Cooley. This week, the device in question is your cell phone, and as Brian points out, it may be giving up more info about you than you know, or than you want to know. Seems everybody's freaked these days about being followed or tracked from up there. But one of the biggest misconceptions I hear about GPS all the time is that those satellites are tracking you. They don't. They actually can't. But they do enable devices down here on the ground to do so. And one of the most insidious isn't even a tracking device per se. It's your smartphone. First, a little explanation how all this stuff works. The Global Positioning System, or GPS, is a network of about 30 satellites constantly orbiting the globe, run by the U.S. government, and what they're doing is always sending down to Earth a signal indicating where they are and when they are there with extreme precision. Now, devices down here on Earth with an inexpensive GPS receiver chip in them pick up all those signals and can make sense of it. That's how they know where they are. Now, as you know, there are dedicated GPS tracking devices like this guy here. You drop this in someone's purse, attach it to their car, hide it somewhere on their person, and you'll know where they are all the time in real time. But when it comes to sheer numbers, the smartphone is a far more ubiquitous GPS tracker. Its growth has been huge in the last few years. As of now, some 43% of us carry one, and that's growing fast. But unlike a simple tracker, it marries your location to details about your life and makes all of that available via a constant wireless internet connection. For example, I'm out running errands right now while I should be at work. My phone basically knows that because GPS tells it where I am and what time I'm there. I left on my Google Latitude feature, that's recording locations. And since I probably have 3G and Wi-Fi on most or all of the time, those various information gatherers can report my information and things about me without me really being aware of it. Do I have your attention now? Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, just some of the parties that have been in the headlines recently for recording and storing this kind of information. Okay, as bad as this sounds, the good news is this kind of tracking happens on not just a smartphone, but your smartphone. Therefore, you have access to some controls that will let you manage how much of this happens. So know these settings in the menus on any smartphone you own. First of all, be familiar with your phone's GPS menu. You can often turn GPS on and off in several layers. But note that any phone made in the last few years will always reveal your location if you call 911, which I assume doesn't bother you. Secondly, pictures combined with location, that can be particularly creepy. So locate the settings on your smartphone's camera app that can disable automatic GPS tagging of your pictures. Thirdly, know what your apps are doing with your location. Check their settings, look at the disclaimer when you install them, and know that in some cases you may have to adjust your privacy for them on the full website, not within the phone app itself. Now, if all this has you thoroughly demoralized and laying awake at night, take heart in a couple of real-world facts. First of all, among the millions of us, you and I probably aren't that interesting to be worth tracking anyway, at least not specifically. Also, you can take more dramatic steps to shut down your smartphone. You can turn off all GPS technology. You can even turn off the wireless connections when you're not using it. But at that point, you're probably also in the market for a nice three-bedroom cave in Tora Bora. The bottom line this week, only you can prevent cell phone spying. A lot of people are worried about their privacy, but not that many of you do what it takes to lock down your information. It's your data, folks. Dig into those settings. You'll be glad you did. All right, that's going to do it for this time, but come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.